Дякуємо за авто підписникам Маркадо у медіа в цей час, воно нам дуже необхідно. Дякуємо глядачам каналу Маркадо Медіа за збір на цю автівку. Слава ЗСУ! Дякую, друзі з НАФО, мій нами є Піт Хастелавіста з Project Constantine. Цей чудовий біст був донатив до бригадів, які ми знайомі в Форесті, 67 бригад. 69th Snoopy Brigade donating to 67. It's pretty cool. I keep bumping into this vehicle in the forest. We never have time. We never have time to to actually make any videos or, or get inside your vehicle and, and, and do any missions with it because we're just we're like passing ships in the night here. But Mercado Media, Andrew, the you, you NAFO supporters, it's beautiful to see this grand vehicle that you've got for this for this brigade because it's a reliable vehicle and I've never seen it anywhere other than in the forest. I've never seen it in the garage. And yes to that, and uh, and all Ukrainians must yeah, live. Bakhmut is Ukraine. This forest is Ukraine. And Ricardo Media and NAFO, you guys are here supporting us, man, and we freaking love you to pieces. Thank you for what you're doing for the soldiers of Ukraine. God bless you. To victory. Do peremoha. We are Marines from the Strike and UAV Company of the 35th Marine Brigade. We kindly ask the NAFO community and the charity fund HELP99 to provide us with the pickup trucks so we could keep effectively execute combat missions. We will be grateful to receive support and help from you. Slava Ukraini! Heroin Slava! All right, everybody, and that is the latest fundraiser that we're doing, and I have good news. We're at 61%, $12,000. $45 out of 19500 so we're already well on our way for another truck. Good job. And this truck was already purchased ahead of time, so we got to finish this so it can go on this next convoy. Because I was going to be going on the May convoy, and I talked to Dimitri yesterday and today, and it's all good to go. I'm going to be going on the June convoy instead. So pretty excited about that. So that means we're going to have another truck, which we planned on it anyways. It's not like we weren't going to fundraise another truck next month. And after this is finished, we'll just literally start another one and we'll have drones attached. So expect the next fundraiser to probably be like $27,000 um, because it's going to have drones involved. Because as we know, Ukraine is using crowdfunded drones. You go to that source right here. Ukrainian, okay. Ukrainian commander drones. That, that came out yesterday. There we go. We're only holding back the Russians with crowdfunded drones, you guys. So literally these fundraising efforts are, I mean, they always have been, but even more so now, uh, your uh, donations and what you do to help Ukraine with the NAFO 69th Stephen Brigade and what we do with that is, uh, is being heard from commanders directly. Ukraine is only holding back a Russian breakthrough with drones paid for volunteers as Western arms supplies run out. That's so sad. And I'm not going to... Let me see if I can get around that. Lieutenant Colonel Pavlo Korlenko, a commander of the separate Special Purpose Battalion, said he believes that lack of Western-supplied weaponry was horrible 
and frontline units were relying on donations or sourcing drones themselves. He warned that Russia was preparing a massive offensive this summer and said that without fresh deliveries of aid, Ukrainian, sorry, I'm not, Ukrainian troops would soon have to fall back to the Dnipro River. The only thing preventing Russia's breakthrough on all fronts is FPV, first-person drones, 90% of which are being provided by volunteers or military divisions themselves, Lieutenant Colonel Korolenko told The Telegraph in an interview at the end of February. A year ago, it was a bad situation. Today, the situation with shells and gear is just horrible, said the commander, one of the so-called cyborgs who fought off Kremlin forces in the battle for Donetsk airport. Leaning forward in his chair in an office decorated with captured Russian assault rifles, Lieutenant Colonel Korlenko placed his handgun on the table and thumped his fist as he explained the struggles of his men. Korlenko is honest about the disparity between the amount of ammunition his men receives and the enemy. Often, Russian mortar teams have three times as many projectiles as his troops. Imagine, a column of Russian head hardware comes at you. They attack. If we shoot at them with a mortar, the next day, we will just have machine guns on fire at the next column of tanks. Right? Small arms fire against main battle tanks isn't going to destroy those tanks. They need, they need artillery. They need rockets. They need our ammunition for that. Across the nearly 1,000-mile front, Ukrainian soldiers are locked in a brutal war of attrition as Russia brings its superior firepower and manpower to bear. Fighting when outnumbered is not new to Lieutenant Colonel Kurlenko, as I have to keep refreshing this. In 2014, he defended Donetsk airport against Russian separatist forces in a 100-day battle that created the legend of cyborg Ukrainian soldiers who would never give up. Since the very beginning in 2014 until today, we have always encountered overwhelming forces in infantry, artillery, and equipment. I participated in the Battle of Donetsk Airport. I heard stories. I refuse to subscribe. Uh, I heard stories um, that it was compared to the Battle of Stalingrad. It took. It looks to me as childish fight now compared to what is happening today. I can't say that the Russians are fighting better or worse. One way to overcome superior numbers, he said, is through better training, an area where Ukraine's allies and friends can help. As we got the F expedited F-16 plans uh, that we're trying to get through, uh, training Ukrainian soldiers, but I mean, really, we got to get that aid package through in the in the Congress. Thank you, Anne Marie, for the 40, 40 months of membership. Oh my goodness, forty months of being a member on Mercado Media. That's 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 amazing. Thank you so much, M Mod Anne. Russian losses as of April thirteenth, over a thousand. We got some gains by Russian forces on the map, and we're going to get into that. 47 APVs, 57 vehicles and fuel tanks, 23 tanks, 32 artillery systems, 40 UAVs, a cruise missile, one anti-aircraft system, and five special equipment. That is Russian losses as of April 13th. And right now, when you're seeing this increase of troop numbers, um, that, that's going because Russia's trying to advance and they have succeeded in advancing, but they take lots of losses in doing so. It's like two things are true. They're advancing... They're getting ground, but they're also taking heavy losses in order to get this, this ground here. All right, let's go through a map update. From north to south, I'll just, I'm just going to highlight the four areas on the map that we focus on, but only one area we're seeing Russian advancements. Okay, so here's one of the fronts. This is the Kupiansk, this is the Kupiansk Sivirsk front. Okay, nothing's changed up there, but I'm just going to highlight that. Then you have the Solodar Bakhmut area. The south of Donetsk and Zaporizhia. Then you have the Zaporizhia front. Okay. Then you have the southern axis Kherson front. Right. That's also that's just like the static front line. Russians are trying to gain ground. Ukrainians are trying to defend that ground. Obviously, we know the Russians are attacking with Iranian Sahid drones. Maybe you've heard about Sahid drones today. Okay. Maybe you've heard about them because of Iran launching an attack on Israel, which I just covered. For an hour and a half, people covered it all day, but I feel like we tapped in at the perfect time because the people were waiting on the attack. We saw the attack, and it's over for now. We don't know if there's going to be any further, but at least for right now, that attack on Israel from uh, the Iranian Sahid drones, we watched them get intercepted. Well, Ukraine had some air defense last year and the year before. This year, they're running low on it, and these drones are hitting civilian targets. So just because Russians aren't over here, up in Kiev or in central Ukraine or western Ukraine, drones, Sahids, Iranian drones from Russia are being sent to those places. But this is just when it comes to the static changes along the front line. So nothing, uh, nothing here, okay, nothing in Zaporizhia. 
nothing in here sewn for changes and nothing up here for changes. So we're just going to be locked in, focused on this section, which is the Donetsk front line from north of Solidar around Bakhmut to south of Donetsk around Novo Mikolaivka, which is a village just to the southwest of Donetsk city. And that's the area we're going to be focusing on. So uh, I'll, I'll continue to show you guys the whole map of the front lines, but really oftentimes, especially right now, with the Russian advancement, and when we're talking about Russian advancements, it's going to be in the Donetsk area that we're, that we're talking about Russian advancements because Ukraine's holding them back everywhere else. So I'm not trying to doom. I'm not trying to do this, for example. Like this is this is the this is what you got to avoid doing. Right? When I saw this shit, all team. We're gonna get to that in a little bit because it's it's bad for Donetsk. But man, I mean, really, warnings of Ukrainian collapse and defeat. Like that's just not what's happening. That's why it's important that two things can be true. Okay, Ukrainian collapse and defeat is not imminent because of the Russian advancements in Donetsk. Okay, I want you guys to understand that. It wasn't when they were advancing in Bakhmut, and it's still not when they're advancing here. Okay, one section of this front line, we're seeing incremental advances on an every other day basis, maybe. Okay, we're still seeing it. It's still happening, but this isn't, I mean, it's, it's just, we'd be lying to ourselves if we're saying, like, this is... Oh man, onward to Kiev now. We'd just be playing the, the game that Russia tried playing with Bakhmut last year that failed. And now it's sad to see it from dooming. And I mean, it's, it's easy to do because it, we're, we're seeing Russian advancements here and it's important to report on those and talk about them. But to try to say that that's a reflection of like the whole war and like Kiev is falling now is just not happening. We, that reality could happen if we continue to delay aid we don't get Ukraine air defense and ammunition. This trend that we're seeing in this one specific area could expand to other front lines. And Kiev alone, while there's no Russian soldiers around it, the threat of the ballistic missiles and the Iranian Sahids coming in on a daily basis, hourly basis, will continue to penetrate through that. And then we'll continue to hit targets in Kiev. That's not good because those are civilian targets. So we're in this one section. There are Russian advancements, and we'll get into them, okay? You have advancements that are reflected. Again, you're going to likely see more here. I'm preparing you for more. Like, this whole section is likely going to go red in the next week, if the, if it's not yet, but in a, in a day or two. Like, this whole section right here, likely going red. And then Shasivyar, they're, they're pulling out right now. Um, Shasivyar is being hit with artillery, but likely, I mean, I don't know if Russian Russian forces will start pushing into that in a couple weeks or so, but this section right here, heavily or likely under Russian control. It's just not being reflected on the map yet at this point. Like this whole section, we saw video last week, and we'll check in with Greg, see if he's got any updates, but this was just wiped out completely. This whole section just wiped out, and the Russians advanced through Ivanevsky and around it, and pushing towards Shasivyar, they haven't really had much resistance with doing so. We also have a Russian advancement to the northwest of Kostivka. Very incremental, okay? A couple plots of farmland up there, but still seeing some advancements, but we haven't seen around Kostivka. Could be an effort, could be, because Russians have been trying this for weeks and have not been able to penetrate through the northern region of Kostivka. They have not been able to push through here. So, as we've seen Russians do before, they're, they're going to have to go around or try to find a weaker spot in the Ukrainian defenses to try to advance towards villages and that's just what we're seeing in other places as well okay so could be this could be just they found some farmland that the ukrainian defenses were weaker and they gained that but it's very very incremental here okay you when you look at it it's just a piece of farmland slice of farmland here slice of farmland there nothing major okay south continue going south here around avdivka nothing new around Semenivka. And nothing new in terms of Russian gain ground, but it's not looking good. It's not looking good for the Ukrainian village of Sevenivka. So you have multiple villages to the west of Avdivka, Stepova, Berichi, got Orlivka, okay? And then you got Semenivka, which is still under Ukrainian control, but the Russians have pushed into the village in the southern region, right here. They pushed into that. So this, Ukraine still holds it. They're still maintaining it, but it's, it's not looking good for Semenivka. Um, for Russian occupation coming up here in the next week or two. Just seeing what we're seeing trending 
from the Russians advancing in this section. Again, it's very limited to just this Donetsk front line from Bakhmut down to just south of Donetsk. So when you hear when you hear dooming rhetoric, just understand it's easy to fall into that trap. Okay. Ukraine's still defending the majority, overwhelming majority of the front line has not changed. Like it's it's fact the majority of the front line has not changed. Okay, let's go like this. That nothing's changed. Okay. That's that's a giant section. Let me pull full screen. Oops. Full screen. Okay, giant section. Nothing has changed, guys. Okay, even with these advancements, okay? And then from, from, no, nope, that's Bachman. And then from here, this part, up there, nothing has changed. At all, period. If anything, the Russians are failing miserably up here. While we're seeing some successes down here in this section, which that, I'll put that green now so you can see and get a perspective. There's where Nova Mikolaivka is. And then there's Bachman, where we're seeing Shasivyar. Okay, so right in there. That's where we're seeing bits and pieces of Russian advancements within that. Okay, and it's not even the whole front in here either. I'm trying to give you the perspective. Okay, it's not even this whole front either. It's sections within that. So, unfortunately, when you're seeing when you're seeing rhetoric like this, Ukrainian collapse, defeat. It's it. I think it's just dooming. Okay, it's not in the best situation right now. It's, that's not what I'm trying to deny. It's a bad situation for artillery. Bad situation for the troops that need to be replaced out there. But Ukraine's doing what they can to fix that. We're doing what we can on our end to get this aid bill through and more aid bills so that way our, our ammunition and artillery flow through. But I mean, look, okay, pull this whole section. As hard as Ukraine is fighting in the uphill battle that they're fighting right now, nothing. No static changes from Kherson over into Donetsk, past Zaporizhia. Like those Ukrainian counteroffensive gains, not or Bakhmut starting to lose a couple of them, but Ukraine maintains Klitschivka and Andrivka. But Velka Novosilka here, that's nothing's changed. Okay, that was big Ukrainian counteroffensive push. Multiple villages were liberated. Nothing. Okay, uh, or Orikiv, Orikiv. If anything. Looks like the fighting is pushed back a little bit. It's not a Ukrainian counteroffensive, but reported Russian gains here have moved back. Like very incremental. You know what I mean? That's like a piece of a city street. You know what I mean? Nothing to write home about. Nothing to go major breaking news. But still, I mean, there's nothing changing here. So the overwhelming majority of the front in Ukraine is unchanged. It's just we have to focus on the Russian gains when they happen. But I don't want you to doom about it too hard. Okay? But the Russian advancements are happening in this eastern section. Peace here. Russian gains, certified gains. It's not through a village. It looks like it's through part of a river, okay? Some grid squares north of Novomikolaivka. Ukraine must have some strong defensive unit within here. Because it's been now like almost a month. And the Russians haven't been able to occupy this village. It's got, it must have some strong unit right here that's just pushing it back. Because Russians had to adjust because they were pushing through Novo Mikolaivka. They were pushing directly through it. That was failing. The Ukrainians held them back. So then they started going south of Novo Mikolaivka like this. Okay. And they haven't been able to gain any further ground. They got to like the city's edge over here along the waterway, but it's been now a week trying to push north of it. They haven't been able to push. It's been a half a week to almost a week and no further gains up there. And then now we're seeing gains far, far north of there. So yes, Ukraine must have some type of a strong front in Novo Mikolaivka here. We'll see if that changes or if it continues, but it's a very strategic waterway here. A very strategic uh, set of river here and multiple villages on it that are very strategic. Um, you know, Greg will be able to pronounce these, these villages way better, but um, Parasko, Vivka, Kost, um Kotstyanivka, that's a different one though. Because you have that, and that's you gotta pronounce that one differently. Oh, it's Krasnivka and Kotstyanivka. Interesting, okay. Then you got Antonivka, Kanternivka, Ilinka, geez, Yelzi, Yelzi Vativka, dang. Romanivka, okay, you can see it goes all the way up. Multiple villages along this river, so it's pretty strategic. The Russians are having a problem getting through Novo Mikolaivka now. It was looking bad like three weeks ago when we were seeing Russian advancements go through here. 
But now, again, for a couple of weeks, it's been stalled. Just in Novomika Live alone. So something tells me Ukraine has strong defense there. Same in Krasnarevka. This is the biggest city that Russia is trying to gain in the east, which is just to the northwest. So as we talk to Greg and others on the ground, it's really hard to tell when you get, when you get outside of Donetsk city because it's so massive. Even Makivka, which is just to the east of Donetsk. This whole area just looks like one giant thing, like one giant city over here. And Krasnarivka, I mean, you got Star, Stormykolaivka, which is just to the west of Donetsk, but that's literally part of the city. Like, there's a there's a border change, but it goes right into it. And then right outside of that, you have a you have some road, and bam, there's there's Krasnarivka, and that's under Ukrainian control. It's not that far away. Russian forces have been able to push into the southeastern part of the city. It's a bigger city. It's right next to Donetsk, which Russians have occupied since 2014. 10 years of occupation here. Ukraine still maintains this city. And we have been seeing some gains, okay? The only certified new gain is a part of roadway here. Part of some roadway. So fighting continues. Russians are struggling to occupy the actual territory and hold it. But we're seeing incremental gains, at least on a weekly basis, along just this section of the front line in eastern Ukraine. There's no changes. I look every day. I do check the other sectors just to make sure if there's changes or if there's map changes. But just in here, we're seeing it. And then even then, I'll highlight the changes that have happened. So you can see it's not even the whole front. So you got in here. You got... Where else we got? We got a little bit there. You got in here. And that's it. So don't doom it. It's not good because you don't want to see any Ukrainian territory go under Russian control through occupation. But at the same time, it's, it's like two things can be true. This is going to continue if Ukraine doesn't get support. And you will see Russians advancing, which nobody wants to see. But it's also true that it's not like Kiev is going to fall tomorrow because of this. Okay? Does that make sense? Or, or, or whatever. Like the front line isn't collapsing because of the... The portions along the eastern front are our Russians are slowly advancing within this. So try not to doom. It's it's just bad news because the West is literally just watching this happen, jumping from conflict to conflict, claiming support to the very end for all types of places. Well, it's sad to see this. And that's also true. It's like multiple things are true at once. Russians are advancing. It's not an indication that the entire front is collapsing. And we will also see Russians continue to incrementally advance if we don't give Ukraine aid and we don't get them ammunition and we don't get them supplies. And that, if that is sustained, that could carry over into other sections of the front. Right now, it's just pretty limited to here and it's sections of it. And that's the reality that it is. Okay, can't change that right now. You can change it by giving Ukraine ammunition. That'll change it. But in order to stop that from spreading to other places, ammunition, ammo, 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 artillery. Good news, more good news, right? Just to try to give you perspective. I mean, it's not good news that the Russians are advancing, but I hope that you can see that it's literally not the entire front line and it's not something to doom about right now. It's just something to doom about the American government situation and leaving Ukraine high and dry. But that's, it's part of the conversation, but it's really a subset conversation that you really should, you really should dig into. But we'll get into that as we get closer to election time for real, for real. But I do have good news elsewhere with Ukraine getting additional Patriot defense systems that they so desperately need from Germany. Okay, so this is good news. We need some from the United States, though, too. Germany's uh, defense ministry says it's supplying Ukraine with an additional Patriot air defense system. It said the system comes from German military stocks and would be handed over immediately. Russia has been stepping up its missile and drone attacks on Ukrainian cities and infrastructure. Ukraine's president thanked Berlin, saying the delivery comes at a critical time. For more, let's uh, speak to Marina Moran from the War Studies Department at King's College London. Marina, why is Germany sending another defense system? To Russian okay, sources. wow, why did I, I was just trying to put the subtitles on, my bad. Germany sending another defense system right now. Hello, Michael. Well, Chancellor Scholz apparently had a call with President Zelensky in order to agree on sending another 
Patriot um, air defense system to Ukraine specifically because of the intensified Thank you, Rob uh, Russian strikes on that. Ukrainian critical infrastructure. We remember a couple of days ago, Russia managed to destroy one of the biggest power plants in Ukraine, the Tripilia power station. So I, I think that for Germany, this is um, a way to get out of this diplomatic deadlock about a Taurus missiles. So at least Germany is doing something and sending mm -hmm. a Patriot battery which Ukraine could use right now um, in order kind of to normalize the relations with Ukraine, specifically because of this issue that um, Chancellor Scholz doesn't want to provide uh, Taurus missiles to Ukraine. As you well know, this is now the third Patriot system Berlin is supplying. What difference does this system make in Ukraine's defense? Everything. Well, overall, it's better than nothing. But um, Ukraine said that it needs some 25 Patriot systems in order to cover the entire area and to protect it from Russian airstrikes. We have to understand that the coverage area of one Patriot system is estimated to be um, 15 to 20 kilometers um, when it comes to ballistic missiles. So you can imagine that it's just uh, a very, very small area, considering the fact that uh, Kiev still has a lot of critical infrastructure left. So the question mm. is, where will the system be placed? And the other question is, the missiles, the Pac-3 um, or even Pac-2 missiles that the system uses, they are also costly. And who is going to provide them long term to Ukraine? So it's not just the system that you send, you also need to supply Ukraine with enough missiles. Again, Ukraine's president says the delivery comes at a critical time. How critical? Yeah, uh, very critical. I mean, it's that it's we, we just saw a plant get hit in Kyiv a couple of few days a few days ago. Kharkiv needs this thing. Kharkiv needs a Patriot system. Uh, Odessa needs a Patriot system. That's when they're like, we need uh, 24 batteries. And it's batteries. It's not just like one launcher. It's a whole system. We can like I'll pull up the Patriot battery video so you can see it, but it's. It's multiple pieces make up a battery. It's not just like one launcher, you know what I mean? Like... Well, the time is very critical, both in terms of Russian airstrikes on critical infrastructure, and they are being very successful, especially in the past months. And on the front, we're seeing a lot of movement westwards um, by the Russian forces because the Ukrainian armed forces lack the technology, lack the artillery shells, and lack manpower. So they are not able to hold the Russian uh, offensives or the mini offensives, I would call them. Um, they are not able to do that. And so it, it is a critical juncture for Ukraine. But whether one air defense system is able to change that dynamic is questionable. Mm. It bears repeating. This is a defensive system. And one imagines more Patriot systems won't help Ukraine get back to an offensive position. Well, absolutely not. While you can certainly use this system close to the line of contact, the Russians will certainly be hunting for, for Patriot systems. That's why, yeah, they're not going to put it up here. They put it in the... Because Russia attacks civilians. They attack Kiev. They attack Lviv. They attack all these places that the front is not. So these Patriots would be used. Again, Odessa. There's no front line there. Russians aren't threatening to take Odessa or or Dnipro, for example. That's a strategic that's a strategic city to put Patriot batteries in, right? Kharkiv, for crying out loud, that has desperately needed a pat one Patriot battery, let alone like they have they're struggling over there. Up here in the northeast, Sumy, Chernihiv, okay, cover the borders up the up away from the front lines, which are in the south, uh, southeast, south and in the northeast up here in Kharkiv. That's where they're needed. They need it spread out. They've been hunting for Iris D and S300 and have managed to destroy some and allegedly some Patriot batteries, according to Russian sources. That being said, um, there is a risk of having that system so close to the line of contact. And obviously, the line of contact, if we look at, at the front, it's over a thousand kilometers. One uh, Patriot system is not going to defend against Russian glide bombs, for instance. So it's not going to be a substantial difference. It's more of a diplomatic gesture than anything else. That's uh, Marina Moran from uh, King's College London. As a
Alright, and we got Vladimir Zelensky's response. As this day brought a very positive result in our international work, Chancellor Olaf Scholz and I agreed today that Germany will provide Ukraine with an additional Patriot system. We are also working with Germany on an additional Iris T, another powerful air defense system, as well as missiles for our existing systems. German leadership is tangible, and thanks to it, we will be able to save thousands of lives and provide Ukraine with a stronger defense against Russian terror. All right, let's see Zelensky's words here in his video today. Wish you good health, dear Ukrainians. Today, we have a very good result of our international work. Germany will provide us with an additional Patriot system. Chancellor Schultz and I agreed to this today. We are also working with Germany on an additional Iris T. Which is also a strong air defense system and on missiles for existing air defense systems. Germany's leadership is truly felt, and thanks to this leadership, we will be able to save thousands of lives and give Ukraine more protection from Russian terror. Of course, today we also talk with the Chancellor about our joint international events. We are preparing for Ukraine Recovery Conference, which will soon be held in Germany. And together we will do everything to make the Global Peace Summit the first inaugural summit to be held in June a real success. This also requires leadership of partners, and I am grateful to everybody who helps. Olaf, Mr. Chancellor, thank you again for the air defense. We will continue to work with all partners who can also help. This week alone, I have already had conversations and meetings with the presidents of Lithuania, the Czech Republic, Romania, Poland, Hungary, Switzerland, and Latvia. A new bilateral security agreement was signed with Latvia. I also spoke with the Prime Minister of the Netherlands, Greece, Portugal, and Ireland. Today, I had conversation with the Chancellor of Germany. We will do everything to ensure the results in the coming weeks as well. In every conversation, at every meeting, air defense at the front line are the main subjects. We're doing everything to have more capabilities for our defense force and defense industrial complex. Each week, also bring new contracts for joint production of weapons. We are also working to finance more of our production right here in Ukraine. Ukraine's potential to produce weapons, in particular FPVs, is quite high, and we agree with our partners on joint steps to finance this work for the sake of our common strength. The whole of Europe and those who are threatened by Russian terror. Today, it is important to honor all our people who work for the sake of Ukrainian strength. This day is a professional holiday for the Ukrainian defense industry. Today, I granted state awards to people who are actively developing this industry of ours. Most of them cannot be talked about openly right now, and the reasons are clear, but this does not diminish our gratitude to them. I am proud of every enterprise that produces weapons for Ukraine. We are all rightfully proud of every result of Ukrainian weapons, our drones, which can reach more and more distant targets. And we are proud of the results of our missiles and the production of shells and artillery. It's fundamentally important for Ukraine. Some production facilities that we haven't had since, independence are already yielding results. And despite all difficulties, 500 companies are currently operating in our defense industry. Most of them are private initiatives. Ukrainian character are entrepreneurs. Show themselves from the best side. I am grateful to everyone. I am grateful to all of our 300,000 people who create Ukrainian weapons. Thanks to everyone who helps. Today, as always, I was also in touch with the military officials, with the Minister of Defense. The situation at the front line in some directions is quite difficult. And everyone who is now showing their resilience, everyone who defends our position, is doing a tremendous job. I am grateful to every soldier and commander. We are working with partners, particularly in the United States, to strengthen our actions 
Glory to everyone who prevents Russian terrorists from achieving their goals. Glory to all who really protect life. Glory to Ukraine. And that's President Zelensky talking about his meeting with Olaf Scholz and getting new Patriot batteries in. Let's go. Let's pull that up really quick. So you guys can see what a Patriot, in case you haven't seen one. Patriot missile. Patriot missile battery. I wonder if they're getting one or multiple. You know, just, this is older. We've watched this before, like when Ukraine was getting the Patriot batteries, but they're getting more from Germany. Zoom in a little more. Zoom fast forward a little bit. Coming right off the plane. What up, Cass? How you doing, buddy? Everybody check into the chat. Let me get a plus plus from the chat. Smash that like button. Make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube channel. I do nightly coverage of Ukraine. Minus Sundays. Which I need for tomorrow to get to move. Get ready to move. Breaking news when it's needed, like we did earlier tonight. If you tuned into that, thank you. Got like 8,000 viewers tuned into that one. That was a stream stream. Yeah, you can see how the, like, the U.S. military sets it up. It's multiple pieces. That go into what a Patriot battery is. Yeah, they're either working with the German military there, actually. Looks like a German military operator. I could have chose. Ironically, I could have chose. Oh, that's that. No, that's freaking. That's French. Um. Look like the same dark color. BDU you know, or the camouflage uniforms. Anyways, I could have chosen that job, Patriot missile operator. It was offered to me when I joined. Kind of glad I didn't though, because I like being an idiot, Mike. I like being able to drive and go on convoys. We we supplied Patriot batteries with with equipment that they needed. What year was this made? They got multiple uniforms seven years ago. Now this is when the army was changing over uniforms. We were going from We were going to this one. What up, Step Tones? Fort Bliss sucks. I was in Fort Wainwright in Alaska. Fairbanks. You're a C-130 Hercules drop master, huh? Look at all that parts. See, it's not just the launcher system itself. Look at all the parts that go into it. All the different pieces. Equipment. You did basic at Fort Bliss in 87? At least when I got out, they weren't doing basic training there anymore. They didn't they only had they only have basic and trade dock at certain places now. Dutch flag. Man, I, I had to learn how to, like I told you guys before, I had to set up that radio system. I couldn't imagine having to set all this up. God, that would just be busy work. I'm glad I didn't choose this MOS, actually. Okay, fast forward just a little bit. Loud generator noises. But again, we're watching this to show you guys what a, a Patriot battery looks like. You were stationed at Eilson. We went there to play football on weekends. Because it's in North Pole. 
they had a beautiful indoor facility built with a turf football field so we, we played um, flag football and then I volunteered for all missions that we went to Anchorage for they're called Polar Express missions there it is there's like a drone shot um, Polar Express missions down to uh, Anchorage, Alaska. See how many parts go into it? And I couldn't even talk as an expert about this. Like I, I should, maybe, maybe I should have chose this MOS. I'd be able to been and talk about it from a position of knowledge. Do I have any Patriot operators in the chat? Chat, I, I did. I'm a Patriot operator in squad. Does that count? Look at that thing. Where are they with Patriots? The White Sands, New Mexico? Looks, look, let me see, does it say this though? Yeah, White Sands Missile Range. Anyone ever, have to, anyone ever go there? I never did. I went to, we went to Fort Polk, Louisiana for our big training. And then by the, when I left Alaska, they went to NTC at Irwin. Getting ready to go back to the stand. You were at White Sands? I heard nothing but bad things. Fort Polk was miserable. It's just sticky. Just humid out there with miles gear just sweating just hot all right so that's one exact patriot battery at white sands the patriot missile in action here you guys go from the national guard youtube channel the primary surface to air missile system or sam in use by the united states army is the MIM-104 Patriot. The phased array tracking radar to intercept the target component of the missile has given the name to the U.S. Army's primary high to medium air defense, or HIMAD system. Let's go, let's go, let's go, keep going, keep going, keep going. Having been tasked with the Army's anti-ballistic missile system as its primary Yeah, mission, we watched that video. uses high performance radar and an advanced aerial interceptor missile. Good video then. Enemy aircraft. Hell yeah. You gotta, you gotta fly the American flag off of it. It's required. How the Patriot Missile System works in Ukraine. Wall Street Journal. It's from eight months ago, but it's still relevant. As, again, Ukraine is getting another battery from Germany. That's how it works in, in Ukraine, specifically. This is the US-made Patriot Air Defense System. Since two were delivered to Ukraine in April, it's proving to be an indispensable tool in Kyiv's arsenal. That's because the system is defending Ukraine's ground troops, cities, and critical infrastructure amid a barrage of Russian attacks. So why does the Patriot have an advantage? Ford Polk is the reason France sold Louisiana to the U.S. <laughs> over other air defense oh systems. God. Let's break it down. <laughs> At the start of the True. war, Ukraine relied on a <laughs> stockpile of Soviet-era defense systems. Those weapons can target slower moving aerial targets, such as drones and cruise missiles. The equipment release the, where you sit there in that, oh God, dude, you're waiting for your Humvee to si be signed out. But they've struggled to combat fast sweating missiles. Now, That's before the training even starts. Ukrainian forces to intercept I'm getting triggered. Projectiles. That's according to a Ukrainian air defense commander interviewed by the Wall Street Journal. Now for us, this threat, sorry, I'm sorry, I'll translate that. He says, now for us, this threat has partially disappeared. Thanks to the Patriot. Here's how it works. So if anything, it's, this is how, this just should tell you how important this system is. So like when the DW journalist was asking like, you know, why is this important and not, it, it, they're both important, offensive capabilities and like that Taurus system from Germany. But they're, because they're not giving Ukraine the Taurus system, they're like, okay, well, we'll give you a defensive system at least, right? This is a purely defensive system that will protect civilians because Russia sends ballistic missiles at civilian populated areas within Ukraine. It's not even a matter of putting these on the front lines to protect the soldiers. This is to protect the civilians. Patriot missiles consist of multiple components. Three of its main parts sit on top of truck platforms. 
The radar tracks missiles and other targets. It can detect aircraft up to 62 miles away and ballistic missiles more than 100 miles away. It sends data to the engagement control station. That unit then processes the information before sending it to the launching station, which can carry up to 16 missiles. Patriots provide the technical possibility of destroying ballistic targets. It can quickly intercept targets that fly on ballistic trajectories. Ones that can rise by some tens of kilometers and then quickly descend. Military analysts say the system has outperformed initial expectations in Ukraine. No one was 100% sure that the Patriot was capable of destroying a KH-47 hypersonic missile until Ukrainians proved it. Also known as the Kinzhal, the KH-47 is one of Russia's most advanced weapons. And that's why, I mean, not giving excuse, I'm not going to, but the West was worried that that might be it might be a show of weakness if that Kinzel can hit that Patriot, right? Then, right, and then Russia would have proved that that Kinzel can, and Ukraine proved it wrong, as usual. Another move where Ukraine proves everybody wrong, and they're able to intercept the KH-47 with a Patriot. First time they proved it, that it can be done. On May 16th, a Patriot detected six Russian Kinzhal ballistic missiles at a distance of around 125 miles. The system launched interceptors, destroying all of them. Patriots in Ukraine fire at targets using two different types of interceptors, Pac-2 and Pac-3. Pac-2 downs targets through blast fragmentation, and Pac-3 uses hit-to-kill technology instead. By combining the Patriot with other air defense systems, Ukraine is now fending off most aerial threats against Kyiv. However, the Patriot does have some disadvantages. It's by far the most expensive single weapon system that the US has supplied to Ukraine. Each Patriot system costs around $1 billion and takes two years to build. The missiles fired out of the Patriot are expensive too. Each pack three costs around $4.1 million. So the battery itself is $1 billion. Each missile is $4.1 million. Huh? The high cost per missile and the relatively small number of missiles in a battery means that Patriot operators cannot shoot at every target. In addition, the Patriot requires a lot of manpower. The systems need as many as 90 soldiers to operate. Uh, Metal, uh, Metal Gear series predicted all of this. Um, the fact that you're cucked to the cost, the cost, the cost of the weapon systems. That's what you. That's the appeal from Zelensky in his interviews, right? Like, damn the cost of the weapon systems, right? And and these weapon companies that make so much money, like there, the guys got to be a point where I don't know. They got to come together and be like, make money later. But I don't think they're going to. It's they're not going to do that. The moral aspect of it's gone. It's all about making money off these things. Um, but a game franchise called Metal Gear Solid, specifically Metal Gear Solid 4, predicted what we're seeing right now. And like corporations and the, the weapon manufacturers, like dom they're, they're, in full, they're in control as well because if it's too much to send a weapon system, a government isn't going to send it. That means the money is controlling it at the end of the day. But the control which, which I feel shouldn't be a thing. It shouldn't, be, it shouldn't even happen. Like what, if, it, if we ever do fight World War III or World War IV, because Russia... From what I, everything I've been watching, Russia thought Cold War was World War III, so in their mind, they're already fighting World War IV. But in case we ever do go to world, grand world-scale warfare, that's going to be tough because people are going to be like, this costs too much and that costs too much. and We can't spend money to defend these people. And it's just going to, we're going to be cucked to how much things cost, which that's not going to be good when decisions need to be made. A moral decision needs to be made to protect people and keep people safe. And these things cost so much goddamn money. And there needs to be a point in which that shouldn't matter. And that, I don't know, but it's not going to, I feel it's a losing battle because these weapon manufacturers make so much money and they're not going to give that up. Rated in the field by as few But I feel like that's going to shoot us in the foot at some point when, if, if this ever does become a world war again, and we're going to need protection. Gaining more batteries could help Kyiv in a number of ways amid the counteroffensive, namely being able to protect ground troops from aerial threats as they push to retake territory. This summer, the US announced a new military package worth up to $500 million. The aid will include ammunition for Patriot systems, according to a statement from the Pentagon. There are at least two full Patriot systems operating in Ukraine. In July, Germany announced it would provide two additional Patriot missile launchers. 
Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has said the country wants as many as 50. Yep. They need them. They wanted 50. That was eight months ago. Now, they're just, now they reduce that by half. They're like, okay, we, we need 50, but 25. And they keep reducing it because they're trying to get something there. But it's a good move from Germany today. Gives you some background on the Patriot missile system and how it's effectiveness. Here's Ryan Macbeth a year ago talking about how it works. He's good. Good, Ryan. How does Army air defense work? Well, in order to answer that question, I want you to think of the Navy. Stay with me now. Whenever some tin pot little dictator starts running their mouth and threatening their neighbors, America takes an aircraft carrier and parks it off that dictator's coast and says, what now? But what if there's no coast? Well, that's where Army air defense comes in. When you think about it, air defense is really the Army's only strategic arm. It doesn't just protect critical assets like airfields or bases, it can also project power. Army air defense missiles like the MIM-104 Patriot have a range of roughly 99 miles or 160 kilometers. This means you can reach far into an enemy's airspace from the protected borders of a friendly nation. This means you dominate that airspace and can shoot down enemy aircraft, drones, and even ballistic missiles. Thank you, Cajun. What really blows my mind about ADA or air defense artillery is that these young men and women are essentially air traffic controllers who can snuff out hundreds of lives with just the press of a finger. Launch Engage. Launch target, and you've just killed hundreds of people in a civilian airliner. Fail to launch at a ballistic missile, and you've just taken a chemical warhead to the face. The amount of mental stress on ADA personnel has been likened to actual trigger-pulling combat, as stated by this Marine infantryman who joined the Army as a Patriot crewman. This Marine actually shot down incoming missiles that were flying toward the United Arab Emirates. Wow. So when you're under fire as an air defense crewman, you're under an enormous amount of stress. But you can't move, and you can't shoot back. All you have is faith in your equipment. So let's talk about this equipment and how a Patriot missile system actually works. Okay, just give me one minute to pay the bills here. This video is- Shout out to Ryan Macbeth for the video. Anybody who was part of the United Steel- Okay, he's doing a sponsor, so let's go through. As aircraft became more of a threat during World War II, some of these coastal artillery units became anti-aircraft artillery units. In fact, you can still see some of the old anti-aircraft artillery emplacements by the Golden Gate Bridge where they were built during World War II. So if you've ever wondered why the Army calls their air defense air defense artillery when they use missiles now, it's because when it started, all they had were guns. Flat, Around the, the flat late guns. 40s, early 1950s, the Army was in the middle of the Cold War. The Soviets had the atom bomb, but the only way to deliver it was through these high flying, but very slow moving bombers. So the army worked on a very special missile, the Nike Hercules, which was scattered around America to protect America from the looming Soviet threat. But the Nike Golly. Hercules wasn't all that mobile and it wasn't very good for short range or medium range targets. The so Nike the Hercules. On another missile called the Hawk. The Hawk. Now, the Hawk Ta Taiwan has those, right? And Ukraine's trying to get some more of those. We phased out to the from that to the Patriot. It was a great missile, but it required two different radars, and the missiles were exposed to the elements, and it took a lot of personnel and equipment and vehicles just to make the thing work. So it was good, but not perfect. By the late 1960s, both systems have been showing their age. There yep, Hawk is still in use. Exactly, Todd. And materials and fuel systems. Taiwan uses it right Something now. Something new was needed. Enter the MIM-104 Patriot. This would be a revolutionary weapon. Instead of the multiple radars needed for the Hawk, you'd only need one radar with the Patriot. Instead of six launchers like with the Hawk, you could have up to 16 with the Patriot. Instead of missiles that were exposed to the elements like the Hawk, Patriot missiles would come in their own certified sealed containers. Once they left the Raytheon factory, they would never need to be inspected or maintained. So how is this revolutionary weapon system composed? Well, it depends on real world conditions, but you'll always have the big five. The ECS, the radar, the antenna mass group, the power plant, and at least one launcher. The ECS or engagement control station is where the operators sit. Mm. Oftentimes this is just called the van. The ECS the van. will always contain one air defense artillery officer and one highly trained air defense artillery soldier. Sometimes a van might also contain a radio telephone operator who relays information that's going on around the site. The officer is known as the TCO or tactical control officer. They're known as 14 alphas, which is the army code for an air defense artillery officer. 
Note that since the van is the only piece of equipment on site that's air conditioned, oftentimes the TCO is jokingly referred to as the temperature control office. Going to sit in there. Other soldier at the console is known as the TCA or tactical control assistant. These are enlisted soldiers known as 14 Echoes, and these are some of the smartest and most capable soldiers in the entire army. So the fingers that are poised over those fatal uh, buttons are often soldiers. You're thinking of the Dragonfire laser, Jason. I'll pull that up in a second. Just got out of high school or a couple years graduated from college. Now the ECS is just an air-conditioned box without radar. The Patriots radar is known as the AN. MPQ-65. Wow. This is an extremely powerful radar unit. So powerful that they actually lay razor wire in a 120 meter arc. So that way soldiers don't get microwaved like a hot pocket when the radar is emitting. What? So if the radar is the Patriots' eyes, the antenna mast group is the voice and the ears. All of the data that's getting fed into the ECS is also getting sent to the antenna mast group which is then transmitting that information all the way to a special place called the ICC, wow. Information Coordination Central. Command. This is basically the Patriot Battalion's headquarters. Yep. You see the Patriot- the, the battalion commander will be there, all the high ups will be in there, all the important people will be in that room. Battery doesn't work in a vacuum. It's usually part of four or five other batteries that send all of their data back to the ICC, mm -hmm. which is basically where the whole air battle is coordinated. And the ICC doesn't work in a vacuum. Battle staff, the NCOs ICC in there. He is sucking down data from AWACS aircraft and Navy ships. That way they can figure out how to best employ air defenses. Now the ICC and its associated air battle space coordination centers are this mishmash of troops from all different branches and from all across NATO. And they all work together to coordinate the air battle. This is also the domain of the 14 hotels. These 14 hotels are basically enlisted soldiers who know so much about the air battle that they brief colonels and generals on what's going on and capabilities of different units. That's why like in a direct conflict with NATO, there's they have no chance, no shot. Like our NATO can, can communicate with each other, different branches within different countries. Like say the army of one country can communicate with the, the Navy of a different country. They, Russia can't even communicate with their own units. Okay, they're using they're using like not um it's not even up for a debate. We can you can have a whole communication system and be able to operate weapon systems with a different country completely if they're in NATO and be able to work together uh, right then and there. We do it often. Air defense is the only place in the army where you'll see an E4 specialist, essentially the military equivalent of the drive-through manager at a McDonald's give briefings to full colonels and generals. And all of the information coming into the ICC is also getting forwarded to the Pentagon and even the White House. So air defense is the only job in the army where you might have the president looking over your shoulder from thousands of miles away. There's no other army job quite like it. In fact, there's one common joke that ADA doesn't stand for air defense artillery. It really stands for a different army. <laughs> if you think about it, they should be part of the Air Force. Now, all of these electronics are powered by one generator truck that has two power plants. And these two power plants are pumping out 1,000 kilowatts of energy. That's enough to power 33 American homes for one day. But none Yeesh. of this stuff would work without the launchers. That's the domain of the 14 Tangos. These soldiers are experts at setting up and reloading these missiles. If the 14 Echo is the brain, the 14 Tango is the, the fist. The brawn. There's normally six launchers in a battery, but remember, this is a strategic system, so there could be eight launchers or even up to 16. 16. When the Patriot system is deployed, it's the 14 Tango's job to erect the launchers. This is roughly a 30-minute process per launcher that involves inspecting the launcher, inspecting the system. Okay, chat, so just like this job alone, just the specific duty of the Patriot battery requires multiple MOSs, which that's, I mean... I don't, maybe the Tango MOS is you kind of go through. I, I don't know. I didn't go to AIT with, for, uh, for uh, artillery, so I don't know. If you already went to artillery school or air defense school, you can maybe let me know. But like when I went to 88 Mike school, they had, there were some hotels, that, but they had forklift training that we didn't do. Like they, were, they went with us, but they had their own separate stuff that they would go do because 88 hotels are like crips. They operate crisp yards. Um, like the logistics of maintaining equipment in like a consolidated area, which again, like forklift work, 
moving equipment from one area to the other area, consolidating it, etc. I was an idiot, Mike. So I would go line haul, like from one base to another. And yeah, someone asked if I would do idiot Mike again. Hell yeah, I would. Hell yeah, you get off the base that way. You don't have to, you don't have to fob it in idiot Mike. You got work to do. You got missions to run. Things. I mean, I had, I had, oper we had ammunition pallets from the Air Force. We had to go do. We got to work with the Marines with the M1 Abrams, my HET truck, and I got a big HET trailer. I got to drive an M1 Abrams up onto it and transport like four of those. Um, a lot of MRAP tra transporting, but that was the only way you can get off base, go on missions, go on convoys. People would volunteer, like cooks would be like, yeah, I want to get this, because they wanted their driver's badge. So other MOSs would hop on our convoys to get that drive time so they get the driver's badge uh, reward for whatever. Starting the generators, making sure that the system is connected by radio and by fiber optic cable to the ECS. And sometimes they have to do this in full chemical gear. Remember, Thank the you, Patriot Marie. is a strategic system. This means it is a prime target for enemy chemical weapons. Imagine changing a tire while wearing a trash bag. Now imagine having to do that 16 times. And that's basically what a 14 Tango has to do when they set up a Patriot site. The 14 Tangos also reload the missiles. This is a special procedure where the empty cans are removed and new ones are placed on either by using a forklift or a special crane called a GMT. So like that type of shit. I mean, that that's, so I don't know if that, the if the ADA has their own in-house, probably have a hotel in there to operate all of this. So that's probably like an 88 hotel right here that's attached to this air defense unit because that happens too. You could be the only person with your MOS in that in that unit because you're needed. For example, we had one air condition repairman, and he and it's a reserve job. Like you had you had to go to air conditioning school. It's a real I, real thing, and he was the sole person that could fix the air conditioning units in our vehicles in the maintenance bay because it's hot in the Middle East, hot as shit, and the and the air conditioning goes out. Boys, well, you know, ice cubes putting ice cubes in the in the air conditioning to get cold air blowing at us. Otherwise, you're just getting hot air blown at you. And it's so fucking 136 degrees Fahrenheit. And you got uniform and gear on. And you're just, oh, fuck me, bro. Just so hot. And we'd make sure the cooler was filled. We'd have a cooler in our trucks with ice. We had an ice trailer on base. Make sure that thing was filled. That was one of my tasks every day, is make sure the cooler was filled with ice. Uh, the Haji water filled in there. Because, boy... You're you're sweating. You're losing some weight on these convoys because it's hot. But anyways, thinking back, this is a likely an idiot hotel here that's moving this this equipment that they need at this site. Um, and I worked with hotels when I got to the reserves. Um, I didn't work with any hotels, 88 hotels when I was active duty because we were a line haul unit, um, composite truck company. So we did line haul, but we also protected our own trucks with combat vehicles or with gun trucks. So we had Humvee support. We had 10th Mountain attached to us in their infantry gun trucks, but that was kind of weird because they had their own procedure, they had their own SOP, and we had ours, and I feel like ours was better because like we know, we put a lot of work into it. Like that's all we did. Not to say that obviously the infantry doesn't fucking do gun truck uh, lanes, but like we knew how to protect our commodity vehicles the best, and that's like seriously all we worked on was just lanes, 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 lanes. I was a gunner in a gun truck, all that shit. So that's what we really focused on was getting equipment from point A to point B and also securing it at the same time. So I know I know a little bit about combat operations in a gun truck. We had to learn. Or a special crane called a GMT or guided missile trailer. Imagine playing the child's game operation, but with a 2000 pound canister of rocket fuel and warhead that you can't drop more than 12 inches or it might explode. Now, once all the missiles are in place, the 14 Tangos physically unlock the missiles from their travel configuration. That way they can actually be fired from the launcher, and they turn on the missile heaters. These heaters actually prepare the fuel and guidance systems for firing. It takes about 10 to 25 minutes to warm the missiles up. Once all the launchers are set up, the hot crew is formed. This crew is going to be on shift from the next 8 to 24 hours, traveling from launcher trailer to launcher trailer, refueling the launcher trailer generators, and doing whatever the ECS needs them to do, like inspect a launcher that stopped communicating with the ECS. The end result looks what up, Jose? like this. All of this is controlled by a local TOC or a tactical operations center. You might find some 14 hotels in the TOC managing the air battle, but it's mainly where the commander and any ancillary personnel sit. Now, as far as personnel, an ADA battery is normally composed of 100 to 120 soldiers and commanded by an ADA branch captain. 
Patriot Battery is normally split up into three or four platoons. The headquarters platoon is responsible for running the battery. This mm. contains the supply people, the communications people, and it also contains the warrant officers, known as 140 Alphas and 140 Kilos. That's the, that's the true MOS you want in the Army. You want to become a warrant officer. That is the one MO, that's the one rank system structure, the warrant officer structure, where nobody can tell you what to do, really. Not regular officers, and de not definitely not enlisted, because they're officers. You, you salute them just as the same you would, like a lieutenant, captain, etc. But they are special. Like you gotta, you gotta get a, a recommended into that rank structure. You gotta, you gotta uh, write a letter. You gotta get. Rec I think it's like you have to get a pre recommended by another a higher rank warrant officer. To, I think at least two letters. I'm, I'm fucking it up. If you're a warrant officer, you can just comment in the chat, or if you were one. But that is the one rank where. Boy, what's what's war what's war an officer doing? What's chief doing today? Eh. Who knows? What's chief up to? Eh. These warrant officers are the most technically proficient soldiers in the entire battle. Well, yeah, but that's why, because they are. That's fact, though. I'm not saying it's because they're lazy. It's because they are the most knowledgeable. Like they have the tests you have to do to become a warrant officer. Like you are the most knowledgeable of that. You're like a subject matter expert completely. Like, entirely within that. That's why nobody can fuck with you. They are literal rocket scientists, walking gods of surface-to-air warfare knowledge. <laughs> then you have the roughly 20 to 30 soldier fire control platoon. This platoon is run by an air defense artillery officer, usually a lieutenant, and these soldiers work in the TOC or in the ECS, and sometimes they're sent up to the next higher headquarters to manage the air battle. Finally, there's the launch crew. This is roughly 30 or so soldiers led by a lieutenant. And once the launchers are all set up, it becomes their job to be part of a hot crew to service all the launchers, make sure the generators are refilled, and they also pull security around the perimeter of the site. That's what it takes to operate the site. Now let's talk about the actual missiles. Now the Patriot has had a long history, but there's basically two families of missiles that exist today. The Pac-2 family and the Pac-3 family. The Pac-2 missiles are older. They come in the famous quad series of cans. These missiles have proximity warheads, which are designed to detonate when they get very close to a target, killing the target in a cone of shrapnel. Oftentimes, when Patriot crewmen get to launch a real missile, they launch a Pac-2 missile because the fuel in these missiles actually expires, and it's easier to launch the missile in training than it is to send the missile back to Raytheon to be destroyed. Hmm. Pac-3 missiles are a little bit newer, and they're different because they actually are designed to hit the target and destroy it with pure kinetic energy. This means they needed a guidance update package because you're basically hitting a bullet with a bullet. And there's even a more advanced version of the Pac-3 called the Pac-3 MSE. So if you ever see a Patriot missile system that looks like a weird looking Lego set, that's a combination of Pac-3 missiles and Pac-3 MSE missiles. Mm. Now the missiles are useless without the radar and it's the Patriot radar system that makes it so brilliant. Most surface to air missile systems have two radars and sometimes three. There's the search radar that actually goes and finds the target. There's the illuminator radar, which tells the missile where it needs to go. And sometimes the missile will have its own guidance radar, which kicks in in the last few seconds of flight to try to find that target. Now, wow. radar is really just radio frequency energy. Think of it like a flashlight beam, except in a spectrum of light that we can't see. When we shine a flashlight beam on someone, we might see the target, but the target knows that someone's shining a flashlight at it. Most aircraft have sensors that let them know when they're being detected by search radar. And they also have sensors that let them know when they're being illuminated by illumination radar. But the Patriot doesn't have an illumination radar. It just has a search radar that does double duty as an illuminator. Mm. So the pilot is never gonna know that they've been illuminated. So here's how the system works. When the Patriot's radar detects a target, it sends that targeting information into the ECS for the operators to make a decision. If the operators are in semi-automatic mode, they can choose to fire at the target. If they're in automatic mode, the Patriot system itself will decide to fire at the target. Wow. That's right. The Patriot can track over 100 targets, and it's been able to do this since 1980, like Skynet. When the system is directed to fire, it can be an AI. Shoot out of the launcher, and the Patriot system will try to capture that missile. If it doesn't capture the missile within four seconds, the missile will self-destruct. Oh, if it wow. does capture the missile, the system will guide the missile toward the target. Now, a couple of interesting things happen in the terminal phases of flight for the Patriot. As the missile gets close to its target, the radar system sends up an enormous amount of RF energy directed at that target. 
A seeker in the missile looks for this reflected energy. This is called TVM, or track via missile. This sudden increase in RF energy might be the first clue the pilot has that a missile is about to hit him, but he doesn't have a lot of time to deploy any countermeasures. Now, at this point, the missile and the radar system have a vote to determine whether they're looking at the same target. If the two systems disagree, the radar will take over and tell it which target to hit. Wow. If the enemy aircraft turns on a jammer to try to confuse the missile, the missile will missile actually will turn switch on. over into another mode called home on jam and go directly what after the, the jammer. So if you do nothing, the Patriot kills you. If you turn on a jammer, the Patriot kills, kills you. Your... Pretty clever, huh? Now, the average day in a Patriot crewman's life involves a lot of testing. You'll often hear the words table four, table Man. eight, and table 12. These tables are essentially tests that test both the individual soldier's abilities and the abilities of the platoon and the battery oh, I'd suck. collectively. Nope, this see, that's a good, maybe I, a good thing I didn't do the Patriot battery. I suck at flashcards. Uh, I, it's, it's a history. Studying for tests. I'm so, I sucked at studying for tests. Like, I just... I don't know. I just never found a good strategy, and flashcards is definitely not a good one for me, personally. Tests that test both the individual soldier's ability... I would just be trying to focus to memorize the flashcards and not actually look into, like, what I'm learning here. Like, that's what, that's what I looked at that as. ...and the battery collectively. This oh. constant testing and complexity of subject matter is one of the reasons 14 Echoes require such a high intelligence score when joining the Army. And once yeah. they join, they deploy. ADA soldiers get deployed more than special forces. While you are sitting here watching this video, at this very moment, there are soldiers in Poland, Japan, Korea, and the United Arab Emirates with their fingers poised over the button, ready to stop a ballistic missile attack. So that being said, let me take you to a Patriot battery in the United Arab Emirates. They're guarding Al Dafra Air Base. It's January 24th, 2022. There's civilian traffic out there tonight, families and businessmen on their way to Jakarta, Karachi, Islamabad. There's no electronics permitted inside the ECS, so the TCO and TCA fill their eight-hour shift with mundane talk all soldiers share. Mm -hmm. The night wears on. If you had a million dollars, what would you spend it on? Man, I can't wait to get out. We got... 12 days in a wake up. Ouch, what the hell was that? The hell? Ma'am, are you seeing? Contact track 158, contact oh. track 159. That's the noise that goes off in there? Six zero. Holy shit. Patriot detected a TBM or theater ballistic missile threat. The system recognized the profile of an incoming I missile. Hit the alarm, real world. Three incoming ballistic missiles launched from Yemen. So this is what it, this is like a simulation of what that would look like. ECS automatically calculates the point. GIP, also known as the Crater, all three warheads will land inside Al Difra Air Base. The TCO contacts the ICC to verify the incoming targets. Fireball indicates an incoming missile. ICC, this is firing unit four. Fireball, 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 over. Firing unit four, this is ICC. We are tracking multiple TBN. Weapons free. TCA, select and interrogate TBMs. Plans carry IFF or identify friend or foe transponders. TBMs won't have a transponder. Each track will be selected and interrogated. Well, you gotta work through, no, you got stress. That thing's going off and saying incoming, incoming, and it's like blaring while you're trying to do all these decisions and make all these decisions and listen to your chain of command at the same time. It's like a, a different version of like being inside of a gun truck where you're taking small arms fire or like where your convoy is being, you got a complex ambush on a convoy and you're getting hit and you're losing vehicles and like, and you're getting injuries and you got radio and you got to call in a medevac while like you're literally taking shots and it's just a lot is happening at once. Every incoming TBM track is selected and verified. IFF to ensure that none of the tracks would be civilian Engage airliners. Tracks, 158, 159, 160. Incoming, incoming, incoming. System is armed. Weapons free. System switched to automatic mode. The Patriot's computer will automatically select the best missiles and engagement strategy for the target. For this engagement, the computer chooses Salvo. This fires two missiles at each target as rapidly as possible. Track 158 engaged. Track 159 engaged. 160 engaged. Incoming. 
birds away, track 158. Birds away, track 159. Birds away, track 160. So again, this is like a simulation of a Patriot battery intercepting ballistic missiles, thanks to Ryan McBath's channel. The computer calculates the, the point. That'd be stressful. That'd be so stressful to watch this just like on a computer screen. Five, eight. Reminds me of like um, one, five, nine. the 98 Godzilla movie when they're like tracking Godzilla on like the radar and then it like disappears. Splash track one six zero. Splash all three TBM trucks confirmed. <sighs> the Patriot system just saved countless lives. And this scenario actually happened in January of 2022. Mm -hmm. In many ways, the Patriot is the big brother of the world, protecting little guys against bullies since 1991. This video took roughly 80 hours of work between interviews and research and developing the graphics for systems I wasn't actually allowed to look at. I'd like to thank Specialist Ashton Fields, Specialist Andrew, and PFC Anthony Taraco for their incredible knowledge and assistance in developing this video. There are also about 14 yeah, soldiers awesome. in the United States Army and in the Israeli Defense Forces who were very patient with me during these interviews, learning about how systems are erected and how radar works. This video would not have been possible without you. Thank you. So that was a good video. Ryan, you're at 85,000. You put 80 hours into that. That was good. So that again, at the end there, if you're like, whoa, what the hell are we listening to right now? Is this like Iran attacking Israel live? No. It's just we're, we're getting some information on uh, a Patriot battery and what it all goes into for the operations of it. And we know Germany's sending Ukraine another Patriot battery, but we haven't really gone into what that would look like or what that sounds like when ballistic missiles are coming in interesting thank you ryan for that for that video all right beyond that you guys um we got we have that the patriot battery hey right? i went through this already with you guys during the map breakdown at the start of the stream ukraine's army chief says eastern front under intense russian assault and this is colonel general alexander sierski Ukraine's army chief said on Saturday the situation on the Eastern Front had worsened in recent days as Russia has intensified its armored assaults and battles rage for control of a village west of the devastated city of Bakhmut. The statement by Colonel General Alexander Sierski more than two years since Russia's invasion reflected the grim mood in Kiev as vital U.S. military aid that Kiev expected to receive months ago still remains stuck in Congress. Sierski said he traveled to the area to stabilize the front as Russian assault groups using tanks and armored personnel carriers took advantage of dry warm weather that were made easier to move and maneuver. The situation on the Eastern Front in recent days has grown considerably more tense. This is linked primarily to the significant activation of offensive action by the enemy after presidential elections in Russia. A spokesman for the forces battling on the Eastern section of the front said in remarks to Ukrainian television that Russian army was attacking using all types of weapons from artillery to tanks, drones, and guided aerial bombs. With superior manpower and equipment, Russia was fighting alongside the entire front, the spokesperson Nazar Volshin said, adding, the enemy is trying to exhaust the Ukrainian army. Okay, and as we know also that Ukraine's using crowdfunded drones and equipment, and we have our own crowdfunding fundraiser for the frontline soldiers. We have 81 donations so far. The link is in the description if you guys would like to donate to those efforts. Okay. 14 hours ago, Speaker Johnson, speaking of aid from the United States and what's going to happen with that, Speaker Johnson's perilous moment on Ukraine has finally arrived, it says. After months of delay, Speaker Mike Johnson is poised to step formally into the perilous debate over Ukraine aid. Since taking the gavel in October, Johnson has vowed to move another round of military help to Ukraine, but it hasn't happened. With those priorities in the rearview mirror, Johnson is now shifting gears to tackle a package of emergency foreign aid, including new assistance for Ukraine, Israel, and the Indo-Pacific allies. That's expected to hit the floor next week, according to sources in both parties. So we know that that's not what they're focused on. We'll see if they can come up with a package to introduce next week. Well, we know the House is not focused on on that at all. And they're focused on... Um, let me see, I tweeted it out. Let me go show you guys. What? There we go. So here's what they're working on next week. But if they could introduce the aid bill, that's just it's ready. 
for something from the Senate because the Senate aid bill passed with 70% of the vote. Bipartisan. Biden's ready to sign it as soon as it gets through the House because it has to go through the House. That's how bills work. House bills got to still go through the Senate to get to the president or vice versa. Senate bill has to go through the House to then get back to the president. Right? No matter which avenue it goes or where it starts, it has to hit both, both chambers. So let's do that really quick. Mike Johnson. Is there any new videos? We got one day ago. You, you visited Trump yesterday. I don't think we have anything new. Like, that's what he chose to do. You, you visited Donald Trump. And Trump did a campaign speech today. That's about it. There you go. Okay, so that's the update from Mike Johnson. That's it. Oh, geez, dude. Come on. I just saw that asshole Scalise said that they're going to push aside that and do an aid package to Israel only. Where did you see that? Where did you see that on Twitter? In light of Iran's unjustified attack on Israel, the House will move from its previously announced legislative schedule next week to instead consider legislation that supports our ally Israel and holds Iran and its terrorist proxies accountable. The House of Representatives strongly with Israel, and there must be consequences for this unprovoked attack. More details on the legislative items to be considered will be forthcoming. So it looks like they're going to scrap what they had planned and put Israel in the, in the forefront. At least from Steve Scalise, pray for Israel. The United States must stand strong with our greatest Middle East ally. So it's just hypocrisy. Because they'll say this, it's like, they'll say this, but then have Russian propaganda when it comes to Ukraine. Crazy times we're in. Crazy times. Matt Gates, the war, Israel is under attack. Congress, fun Ukraine. Like, both are. Ukraine's still under attack right now. Like, the Iranian Sahid drone attack from Iran themselves to Israel came and went. But guess what? Sorry, those drones are still t attacking Ukrainian civilians, like, right now. Okay? Just not even living in reality. That's Matt Gates, though. He's part of that same caucus. Part of that same, that same area. Not good. Okay, we don't need to get into Trump updates today. I'm just not in the mood. So, the focus tonight is obviously heavily on Iran and Israel. We covered Iran and Israel earlier. If you guys want to check out that coverage, I think it did like an hour and a half. How long did we spend on that? Yeah, 99,000. Wow. 100,000 view banger earlier today. Yeah, about an hour and a half of your time. So, if you have an hour and a half, you want to get all, like we, it was happening all live. All the attacks were coming in. We were streaming it right at the right time. So, if you missed that earlier, that's posted on the YouTube channel already. Is that? Further down the replies, who is Helen while posting these missiles at? I don't know, Cajun. I don't pay attention to my replies as often as I should, maybe. Iran, World War Three, World War Three. That's just this is like Twitter on any other day. This is what's this is what's trending on Twitter. Okay. Statement from Iran. Doesn't seem like there's any other updates from Iran or Israel either tonight. We heard the booms and the sirens. But it doesn't seem like anything's further. Storm or Daniel trial starts on Monday. I'm going to cover it as best as I can. I don't really know if there's not going to be courtroom feed to cover. Uh, whereas the Georgia, the Georgia stuff with Trump, we can that'll be in TV. I'll give you guys updates and give you a summary update of what's going on. But it's not one of those where I... It's like trial coverage that we've done in the past. All right, you guys. Well, that's going to be it for me today with Ukraine updates. It's all the updates I have. We went through a map breakdown, frontline update. Ukraine's getting Patriot missile systems. They're getting reinforcements on the front lines. Um, but beyond that, I'm just, no, nothing from the United States. Mike Johnson met with Trump yesterday. Didn't uh, He said that we're working on a loan for Ukraine. So beyond that, you guys, that's going to be it for tonight. Iran coverage happened. It already happened on my YouTube channel, like I mentioned. If you guys want more from me tonight, 
Really quick, we had a super chat. Merc, they're probably canceling refrigerated week in the house. Bo did a video on their on their idiotic agenda. Yeah, we covered that yesterday. I we watched that video yesterday on stream, but I also like I I posted about the agenda on Twitter, which you can follow me on Twitter as well, you guys, because I'm still on there. Fighting the misinformation that Elon Musk allows on here. We fight back at it. What do you want more from me tonight? Gaming channel. If something no shit scenario happens and I got to come back here and go live because Iran launches another wave of drones or ballistic missiles or something, I will. But until then, I'm going to be live on my gaming channel playing more Cyberpunk 2077. We're playing the whole thing. I think we're doing, I'm going to do Fallout 4 next because that Fallout series is pretty popular. I haven't been able to watch it yet. I love Fallout, but the show is out on Amazon Prime now. It looks like it's getting pretty good reviews. Pretty good. And I love Fallout 4. And I love Fallout 3. New Vegas, obviously. But we're going to be playing that after we finish Cyberpunk. So come on over. Hang out on my gaming channel for a bit. Thank you guys again for tuning in to all of today's breaking news coverage. Another day. Another news. I'm moving. No streams tomorrow. It's going to be a whole day of getting my stuff ready. Monday, stay flexible. Right, Monday's move-in day starts. I have like literally a whole week and some change to get in there, but I want to really get in there Monday, Tuesday at the latest. At least get my stream going in there. Uh, but new things, we're moving on up. New horizons ahead. Thank you guys again for tuning in. Support Ukraine. Hit that donation link in the comments. Also, really quick, you guys, I gotta, I gotta do it. It is what it is. I'm going back to Ukraine in June. I'll have a bigger push for a fundraiser to help me get back to Ukraine in the in the future. Not right now, but in the coming weeks, well, I'll really be pushing this. But if you want to support my journalism work, my traveling with the travelers, the buy me a coffee link is in the description. You can buy me a hot dog, right? The Enforcer channel likes to call me the hot dog boy. So we're playing into that a little bit. And maybe there are viewers that are like, who's the hot dog man? Who is this hot dog guy that they keep talking about? They can come and find out. But buy me a hot dog and the buy me a coffee link link is in the description support my independent journalism link you can become a member there as well you get the badge in your discord server you can become a member on this youtube channel support any ways that you possibly can but thank you so much for just tuning in and liking the video and subscribing to the youtube channel have a wonderful night you guys slava ukraine and vladimir putin do fuck off see you in the gaming stream Where one test gave everything cost.
revenge is a must. Boy, one test get buried in dust. Six to deep on a lip, a boy on down. On the dog, yeah, and I meet with that horse. Payback time, I show no remorse. I'm a guy, cause I like a boss. Bad man, them, they come in like Judas. Want to see me on the nail and cross. <laughs> Revenge is a must. I got lives in my veins, loaded guns, I'm insane. Fight for peace in my land, enemies lying dead. I can't shit with my truth, I run tanks, bulletproof, we attack, we don't play. Don't fuck with you, cram. 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 Rush, 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 rush,